They're the originals of the three wise monkeys. Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. They're Japanese macaques, the monkey that was said to embody all the wisdom of Buddha. They don't all live in the snow, though dwindling in numbers, they're widespread throughout Japan. Some only survive in monkey parks where they're a little better off than in a zoo. One group is making a last stand on a windy island in Japan's extreme south. This is their story, how they live now, what their future may be. A story of a struggle between wildlife and man in one of the most populated countries in the world. It's the story of not three, but over 3,000 very wise monkeys. Forty years ago, the Japanese macaque's range was this. Now it has shrunk to half this size. We are going to visit three main colonies, at Yigo Kudani in the mountains north of Tokyo, at Kyoto, the old imperial capital, and on Kushima Island in the south. The macaques who live in Japan's largest island of Honshu are the most northerly monkeys in the world. They're on the same latitude as New York. Some troops even live high in these snow-capped mountains. They've retreated there to escape from man. Their faces are extremely human, and they seem to be wearing a hood or parka, an entirely appropriate dress in view of their living conditions. The Japanese macaque was well chosen as the model for the three wise monkeys. They're so adaptable and quick to learn. These mountain troops are often called snow monkeys, and with very good reason. They've carved out a way of life for themselves in a thoroughly hostile climate, and by growing thicker coats, have adapted to winter temperatures of more than five below zero. Perhaps brass monkeys would be an apter term for them. Macaques belong to the largest old world family of monkeys, which includes baboons, mangabees, rhesus monkeys, and Barbary apes. Though Barbary apes inhabit the rock of Gibraltar, you'd expect to find their relatives, the macaques, in the tropical jungles of Southeast Asia and India. Well, so you do. But in Japan, they've learned to live in the snow equally successfully. Until 1948, almost nothing was known about the Japanese macaque. Then Professor Itani of Kyoto University began to study them. Today, the macaque is nationally protected. One such reserve is the Nagano Protection Area in Yigokudani. Yigokudani means Valley of Hell. It's a thermal area where geysers and hot springs gush and spurt amid snow and ice. It's a place of weird contrasts. An ice-cold river rushes down amid the steam clouds. Some 500 years ago, a samurai warrior built his stronghold in the Valley of Hell. His castle is just a monument now, and the snow monkeys use its rooftop as a place to play, to groom and be groomed. Most monkeys that live in social groups spend a good deal of their day grooming each other. Though it undoubtedly serves a hygienic purpose by removing parasites, grooming has a far deeper social significance than this. Everyone gets to groom everyone else, regardless of age, sex or place in the hierarchy of the troop. In doing so, every monkey comes to know every other monkey at the closest possible quarters. This familiarity cuts down the risk of quarrels and dangerous aggression as the troop goes about its daily life. It can also be extremely pleasant, as relaxing as a good massage. This is a dominant male getting the full treatment. Very soothing. When the snow is too soft and deep for the babies to scamper around, macaque mothers carry their young on their backs. Most of the young are born between May and September, when the mountain weather is kindest. When they're on the move, the troop travels in single file. Though solitary macaques are found further south, there are few loners in these mountain colonies, 
life is too cold and harsh. Most of the time, the snow monkeys seek the warmth and companionship of their fellows. The snow monkeys spend their chilly nights in the trees. Directly the sun rises, they descend to the valley to search for food. In winter, it's a desperately hard job. Here at Nagano Reserve in Yigokudani, they get a free handout of grain. They search deep in the snow for trifles overlooked from previous feeds. It's very cold work for the fingers. They also dig for their natural foods, roots, leaves, nuts, berries and insects. They've discovered too that they can even get nourishment from bark. This is a habit they've only recently developed. It's another example of the macaque's adaptability to changing conditions. Before man drove these monkeys into the mountains, they were nomadic feeders. They could move with the seasons wherever food was most abundant. The metal feed bin onto which the large macaque is climbing just about sums up their present situation. They're on welfare relief. High in a bare winter tree, a macaque tears off a strip of bark. Scientists say that unless the snow monkey troops had discovered this new item of diet and technique of feeding, they probably wouldn't have survived their retreat to the mountains. It's a trait the macaques and the warmer colonies in the south have never yet developed. Look how far the bark has been stripped from that bar. This youngster has broken off a branch of evergreen. Eventually it too will be eaten. Though the buds and leaves are bitter, they are one of the snow monkey's winter standbys. Young macaques are extremely playful. Their mother carries them for six months and they're born with very little hair and with their eyes closed. The young spend a good deal of time swinging and jumping as part of their education for adult life. Fighting too. They relish playing in the snow almost as much as children. Their thick fur gives them plenty of protection. They never seem to get wet. Young macaques enjoy a close family life. Their antics are surprisingly well tolerated by the adults. The mother-child bond often lasts for life. Babies of either sex tending to inherit the mother's rank in the troop. Macaque children are even tolerated by the dominant males. These adult males stand only about 18 inches high though they appear much larger because of their thick, lustrous fur. Their place in the pecking order has usually been fixed by the time they're five. It doesn't alter after that, even though they live to 30 years old. This colony of snow monkeys is lucky to have a forest left in which to feed and play. Japan consists of a group of islands which together just about equal California in size. 111 million people live there. Demands on living space as well as on forest timber from which to build houses are constantly growing. So forests are increasingly being cut down. Luckily, Japan has realized this. And there's a growth too in the determination to save wildlife wherever possible. This is how reserves like Nagano came about and the macaque got complete protection everywhere. In the snowy north, the Japanese macaque has shown its own determination to survive by defeating the bitter conditions and by learning to get nourishment from alien vegetation such as bark. But there's one even more astonishing survival trick they've discovered which makes life easier in the freezing cold. And that is to make use of the fiery nature of the valley of hell itself, as we shall see later on. Tokyo, the more familiar face of overcrowded industrial Japan. 
Just what wildlife is up against in this small nation is evident when you board the Shinkansen, the so-called bullet train, the fastest train in the world. For the journey southward across the island of Honshu to Kyoto, the old imperial capital of Japan. In the mist, Kyoto might be a scene from a willow pattern plate. It was here at the University of Kyoto that Professor Itani began his study of the Japanese macaque. No snow here and no snow monkeys with their thick luxuriant coats, though these are exactly the same species of macaque as up north in the mountains. They look pretty miserable in the rain, but in one way they are much better off. The temperate low altitude climate of Kyoto is far more friendly. The macaques here could find natural food all the year round, but macaques are great opportunists. Here on the hilltops outside the old city, a great many people visit them. Though they could easily feed themselves, they've come to rely on free handouts. So much so that you can't help wondering whether life in the clean world of snow isn't preferable for all its hardships. On wet days, there aren't any tourists, but the macaque troop doesn't have to worry. The monkey man feeds them with grain and apples. It's as if this troop has been infected with urban discontent. Even though there's plenty to go round, there's often squabbling over tidbits. Wise monkeys? Well, maybe. These macaques have become entirely dependent on their close contact with man. You could say that this too illustrates the smartness of the species. But it seems a pity that the Kyoto macaques appear to have forgotten all about life in the wild. They spend most of the day simply sitting in the trees and lurking around the feeding area waiting for a free meal. This free loading has got to such a pitch that when evening comes, they have to be bribed to leave their lookout posts so that they will at least sleep in their natural environment in the forest. The monkey man arrives with a sack full of apples to persuade them to go to bed. Farther south on the island of Kyushu, there's a macaque troop that are the monkey equivalent of industrial slum dwellers. By comparison, the macaques of Kyoto live as aristocrats. These monkeys deserve the monument erected to them. It's a tribute to their resilience that they've managed not only to hang on, but to thrive in surroundings that are a cross between a very bad zoo and a fun fair. Takasakiyama Monkey Park is visited by thousands of people every day. All semblance of social order between monkeys has broken down. Individuals hardly know each other. Like beggars, they're too busy keeping their eye on the main chance. The stalls are hung with thousands of toy monkeys, made in Japan, of course. Meanwhile, the real thing sits like any bored city kid watching the trains go by. or trying to get something from the junk of a consumer society that in Takasakiyama has all but consumed the macaque. There's a far happier story to be told about Koshima Island on the southernmost tip of Japan. This is where Professor Itani and fellow scientists of Kyoto University made their first successful close contacts with wild macaques in 1952. The Kashima troop, over 50 strong, lives in a setting of sandy beaches and wooded cliffs. The island is difficult to reach, and so they're untroubled by people, except the scientists who come to study them. As a result, they're playful and carefree. The Kashima macaques are closely organized into a stable hierarchy. Disputes seldom break out. Dominance is established by placating gestures like this. When they move as a troop, they're as orderly as a well-trained infantry platoon, with young male scouts out and dominant males as a rear guard.
As with their northern relatives in the snow, grooming has its proper place and function. But with one important difference. They're very vocal, and scientists have detected a speech pattern that seems to indicate a desire to be groomed. Dominant males like this one boss the troop and keep order when necessary. The males sometimes even supervise the obstreperous year-old juveniles when the senior females have new babies to look after. The Kashima macaques live, in monkey terms, a beautifully balanced and ordered existence. Wise monkeys? Most certainly. The Kashima macaques have recently developed habits that even suggest some routes by which early man may have evolved. To get the troops' confidence, the scientists first had to feed them. One day in 1953, a young female called Emo grabbed a sweet potato that was covered with sand and washed it in a stream. A month later, one of Emo's companions did the same. The behavior spread. Within four years, 15 monkeys were washing sand off their potatoes. By 1962, nearly the whole troop had got the habit. In other words, the experience was being passed on. Is this perhaps how human culture began? Later, the monkeys took to dipping their food in salt water, perhaps because it gave it a better flavor. The next piece of learning concerned free feeds of grain. At first, they ate this by picking it up in their mouths. Of course, they picked up a good deal of sand as well. So next, they took the grain to the water and washed it. Afterwards, they had laboriously to pick up each kernel of wheat. It was Emo once again, the wisest of wise monkeys, who discovered that if you simply threw the grain on the water, the sand sank and the wheat floated. One of the most amazing developments was that as a result of all this food carrying, more and more macaques started to walk on two legs. Again, this suggests one reason why we ourselves may have started to walk upright once we had, so to speak, got our hands full. We've certainly had them full ever since. As a result of their amazing discoveries about food washing, the macaques of Kushima Island have become world famous among scientists studying primate behavior and the bearing this may have on our own dim and far distant origins. Anyone you know eat like this? On the sandy beaches of the south, or on the mountain tops of the north, the Japanese macaque is an amazing creature. It's a freezing morning here at Nagano Reserve at Gigokudani, the Valley of Hell. The sort of winter's morning when not even a good breakfast or a thick fur coat will quite keep out the bitter cold. But here, just as on the beaches of Kushima Island, the Japanese macaque has learned a new trick. This time it's a trick that helps it to keep warm. One morning, a young macaque saw food floating on the surface of one of the hot water pools that are warmed by volcanic action. The monkey leapt in after it, and having landed in hot water, found it surprisingly enjoyable. When the anxious mother came to fetch her baby, she refused, like many children, to get out of a nice warm bath. So her mother went in after her and found it remarkably pleasant too. Thus began the unique snow monkey habit of hot spring bathing. Soon it was common practice especially among mothers and young. The only disadvantage is that when you come out, you have to be careful not to freeze up. With macaques, it's always the older males who are slowest to learn. Some still refuse to go into the water.
Perhaps it's not so surprising that once tempted in, the macaques readily took to bathing. In Florida, colonies of introduced rhesus monkeys, who are the macaques' close relatives, actually jump from treetops into water. But admittedly, they live in a warm climate. The thermal springs of Yigo Kudani more than compensate for any chill you feel when you come out. On very cold days, the snow monkeys spend as much time as possible in the water, very often not leaving the pools until mid-afternoon, when they can still catch the last warmth of the sun to dry themselves. They often sit in the rising steam to hasten the drying process. They mustn't leave their last dips until too late, otherwise they'll never dry off by sundown when the temperature falls sharply. Dominance rituals apply even in the leisure atmosphere of the pool. That's what this pickaback ride is all about. Grooming plays an important part in the relaxed social activity around the warm water pool. It also serves a useful purpose in preparing the drying hair to withstand the rigours of the coming night. The face of a macaque. A wise monkey who has learned not only to retreat from man where possible, as in these mountains, but to adapt to his ways where there can be no retreat. The bitter night lies just ahead. Now the snow monkeys must follow the frozen trails back to the tall trees above the valley of hell where they'll spend the night. A fir branch offers a mother and her child a frugal supper that will help them to keep warm throughout the night. The youngster's fur hasn't yet dried off properly, so it will need all the body fuel it can get. The Primate Research Institute of Japan is doing all it can to study the Japanese macaque and to halt the decline in its numbers. There are just over 3,000 of these wise monkeys left in the wild. Their wisdom by itself just isn't enough. The compassion and understanding of mankind will be needed if the Japanese macaque is to have a future. Thank you.